Good evening. I'm Tricia Craig, Vice President for Engagement here at the college, and it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's discussion, The Future of Democracy in America. On this, the eve of the, for, the inauguration of the 46th President of the United States, it could not be a more timely and important topic. It's wonderful to see such a global audience here with us tonight. And in addition to everyone on campus, I'm especially pleased to welcome parents, prospective students, the wider public in Singapore. And I wanna give a special shout out to all of our Yale alumni who are here from across Asia and are with us tonight. We have an incredible lineup of online events this semester where we'll feature conversations like this with faculty from Yale, from NUS and from the college. This is the first in our series and I hope you will regularly join us in the coming weeks and months. Before we begin, I have just a couple of housekeeping announcements. First, we ask that you do not take screenshots or recordings of tonight's session. It will be available on the college's Facebook page. Second, we really encourage questions from the audience and I imagine that there will be many. For those of you here in the Zoom room, please enter any questions into the Q&A function at the bottom and of, of the bottom of your screen. And for those of you watching on Facebook, please use the comments section. Our panelists will try to get to as many questions as they possibly can. And now I'd like to turn this over to tonight's moderator, my colleague, Nomi Claire Lazar. Nomi is Assistant Professor of Politics and Associate Dean of Faculty here at the college. She holds a PhD from Yale and her books include States of Emergency in Liberal Democracies and most recently, Out of Joint, Power, Crisis and the Rhetoric of Time, which is new with Yale University Press. Nomi, over to you. Thanks very much, Tricia, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Classical thinkers held that democracies decline into despotisms, but through constitutional ingenuity and identity centering values of freedom and equality, America aimed for exceptionality. John Winthrop said, America shall be as a city upon a hill and the eyes of all people are upon us. And these words have echoed from president to president, from generation to generation, each seeking to maintain an America, whatever its other failings, that served as a light of democracy and freedom for the world. But the events of the Trump administration have led many to question this American exceptionalism. Our guest tonight will lead us in a conversation on what the future may hold, as we all wait with a little trepidation to see what Inauguration Day and the years that follow might bring. We're going to begin with five minutes of introductory remarks from each of our panelists, followed by a brief discussion before turning to a Q&A with you, the audience. Joining us today are Brian Garston, who is Professor of Political Science and Humanities and Chair of the Humanities Program at Yale. Professor Garston has written extensively on the history of democratic and liberal political thought, notably his book, Saving Persuasion. And Professor Garston is at work on a new book, Demons of Democracy. Uh, and this spring will co-teach a course called The Crisis of Liber Liberalism, together with Professor Moyne and the New York Times column columnist, Ross Douthat. We're especially delighted to have Professor Garson here with us as he was the co-chair of the committee that created the Yale and US Common Curriculum. Samuel Moyne is Henry, Henry R. Luce Professor of Jurisprudence at Yale Law School and Professor of History at Yale University. He's written several books in his fields of European intellectual history and human rights history, and the newest, Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War, will appear with Barra Strauss and Drew this fall. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Ben Shutman is Assistant Professor of Social Sciences here at Yale and US. Professor Shutman is the author of Carl Schmitt's state and constitutional theory, and is at work on a constitutional design project that aims to better protect democracy from internal threats. So I will now invite Professor Garston uh, to, to, uh, uh, to begin. Uh, thanks very much, Nomi. And, and thanks to you and to Phil Gorski, Trisha Craig, Ali Rizels, Kevin, and everyone at Yale and US who's helped to arrange this panel. Uh, it's fantastic to see how the college is thriving. I wish I were visiting in person. Today, we've each been asked to say just a few words on the topic, the future of American democracy. Now, one way to approach this uh, is to talk about the future of the United States. Another approach, which I want to at least raise by the end, would emphasize what the topic actually says, the future of American democracy, not a country, but a kind of political regime, self-government of a large, powerful polity 
through representative democratic institutions. What's the future of that sort of political regime? But first to the more immediate question, the future of the United States. Look, in the very long term, the future of the US is clear. It will fall as all empires do, as China fell before its recent rise again. We have yet to see in human history a political regime discover the recipe for immortality. Now, whether current events in the US are signs of an imminent collapse or not, that's a question I can't really answer. So much depends on what we in the United States do, on what the Republican Party does, on whether we invent institutional reforms capable of responding adequately to emerging majorities without dangerously alienating emerging minorities, on whether we discover a way to master the economy without crushing its vitality, on how we respond to the rise of China, and so on. On that question, since this discussion is based in Southeast Asia, uh, does the return of Asia to prominence on the world stage pose a threat to the future of American democracy? That's an important question, maybe the most important question the US faces in its foreign policy at this moment. The US needs to figure out how best to manage its direct relationship with China and also how to change its understanding of alliances and international institutions and its positioning in the world economy in light of China's rise. But I'm not an expert on those topics. And in any, in any case, I think the current situation in the US shows that the greatest threat to American democracy comes not from its rivalry with other countries, but from within. Consider the much remarked upon fact that the US Capitol at this moment is protected by more soldiers than the United States has posted in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria combined. Protected from whom? From our own citizens. On January 6th, as you know, a mob swarmed and then occupied the Capitol building in an effort to prevent our legislature from formally accepting the results of our recent presidential election as it was required to do by our constitution. There is no civil war, no rebellion, but a whiff of violent insurrection is in the air as it has been for at least the last six months. Or most obviously, let's say a whiff is online and no one really knows how likely it is to cross from the virtual world into the real one. The danger may be only a passing shadow. We may be about to settle back into a dispiriting normality, but it, way, it well may, uh, it, it may well be more than that. Let me take part in the American national pastime of quoting Abraham Lincoln. When he was only 28 years old, Lincoln confronted a deeply divided country and a rash of mob violence, especially in Kansas. When he was asked about the future of American democracy, he said this, at what point is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. I think those words remain true. For us, the possibility of national suicide can be said to arise from two sources, from what is distinctly American and from what is distinctly democratic. It could be, for example, that the racial reckoning we are experiencing in the US shows that the original sin of slavery will in fact be our downfall that it has left such deep scars that even well-intentioned civil rights movements will be unable to heal them. And that would be in some ways a particularly American story. But the other potential source of self-defeat is democracy itself, our chosen form of government. I fear that since the Second World War, especially since the end of the Cold War, we've let ourselves be lured into the idea that living together democratically is easy or that it is a natural state of affairs. That's not true. Democracy is the form of government that requires the most of its citizens. The idea that democracy was easy or natural came partly from the rhetoric of the Cold War and especially from a misguided interpretation of the fall of the Soviet Union. Too many of us Americans were surprised that liberal democracy did not spring spontaneously up in Russia and then surprised again that the quick victory over Taliban soldiers did not produce liberal democracy in Afghanistan. And then surprised again at what followed 
the toppling of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, what followed the Arab Spring in Egypt, the fall of Gaddafi in Libya, the uprisings against al-Assad in Syria, to mention just a few cases in just one part of the world. The same assumptions that left us surprised at the difficulty of democracy and foreign affairs left us neglectful of our own affairs at home. We let liberal freedoms be corrupted into neoliberal materialism. We began to treat constitutional procedures as annoying obstacles to our preferred policy outcomes. We allowed clever young people to build us an online world, and moved our public discourse onto it gleefully without pausing to consider the effects that move was having on how we interact with one another as citizens. We allowed ourselves to be flattered by a media environment that pretended to put each of us at its center, catering to our most trivial individual tastes, stranding many of us in the political weakness of our lonely individual existences behind our screens, content so long as material comforts were delivered to our doors. We let ourselves fall into a state easily manipulated by demagogues. As all students at Yale and US College know from the readings in the philosophy and political thought part of the common curriculum, the history of democracy is in large part a history of factionalism and demagoguery. The framers of the US Constitution knew that history, aimed to show that the ancient vices of democracy could be managed and contained in the modern world with well thought out institutional design and a supportive constitutional culture. The so-called American experiment aimed to prove the possibility of this sort of political regime. Now, I don't know that the particular solutions they came up with in the summer of 1787 are the best we can imagine for ourselves today. But I do think the future of American democracy as a regime type will depend on whether we start to take seriously the sort of problems, the sort of problems the framers had in mind. For example, democracies reliably produce hatred of elites. And the back and forth between elites and the people must be managed. Allowing material inequalities to multiply intensifies the problem. Demagogues will always rise up to take advantage of those inequalities and they too must be managed. And as citizens, we will always be vulnerable to the lure of these flatterers. And so we must manage ourselves too. And that task, self-government, is the one maybe we've been most guilty of neglecting. So I don't wanna over-dramatize the moment. The election we just held was in spite of the story told by the losing side, amazingly peaceful and fair, even during a pandemic. Local officials, judges, and ordinary citizens in states across the US demonstrated their allegiance to our constitutional system, and there are still large reserves of civic potential among young people. All those are crucial ingredients for a flourishing future, but there is at the same time a deep anxiety in the US. Beneath all the partisanship, you can hear a common worry in the face of especially our response to COVID-19. Are we, as citizens, as human beings, really up to the task of governing ourselves or would we be better off giving ourselves over to the rule of benevolent experts? That question should be of interest, I think, not only to the US, but to everyone. Our announced topic, the future of American democracy, is after all, not just about the future of one country. It's about the future of the idea that that country is supposed to exemplify. So with that uh, set of introductory remarks, I'll hand it over to my colleague and soon co-teacher, uh, Sam Moyn. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's uh, a privilege to offer some thoughts on the future of American democracy uh, for what little they're worth. Uh, uh, I want to thank the organizers for including me. So as for Brian, uh, for me, the, the future of American democracy is especially opaque right now. Uh, but for me, it's, it's mainly because of a debate around how to think about the last four years in particular. It's a debate that has been contentious and emotional. Uh, but even today, it's very far from being decided. And I wanna take just a few minutes uh, to lay out what that has, debate has looked like and why I think that it's in the end, the, the most important fact that it wasn't the last four years, but the next four and maybe beyond that will prove the really decisive era 
in which the future of American democracy and perhaps democracy uh, as an idea will be determined. So let me explain what I mean. For the last four years in American intellectual life, there's been what I would call a contest of narratives. Uh, and, and just to, uh, to label and oversimplify, I'm gonna identify two narratives. One I'll call the resistance narrative and the other I'll call the structural narrative. Um, both of them have been galvanized by the coming of Donald Trump and uh, both are, are, are trying to determine whether they're up to the challenge of uh, the era after uh, Trump's uh, departure. So the resistance narrative, as I've labeled it, uh, responded to uh, the election of 2016 by a uh, worrying that American democracy, once the model for the world, uh, was now on the brink of the very forces that it defeated in the 20th century of fascism or the political mod model of tyranny uh, that, uh, as Brian suggested, uh, has, has always been seen as haunting democracy. And in, in this perspective, uh, uh, it, 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 it was tempting to think of, of Donald Trump's election as a kind of accident, uh, as something that didn't uh, contain a kind of verdict on uh, the immediately prior period or even on American history as a whole. The main thing that mattered was ejecting him from power, delegitimizing him uh, uh, at a minimum uh, and turning to uh, the heavy weaponry the constitution uh, allows like impeachment uh, to get rid of him as soon as possible. Uh, and his fall uh, in November uh, 2020 was then seen on this resistance narrative uh, as the opportunity uh, for a return to normalcy, uh, uh, the, the re reinstitutionalization of the status quo ante, or as Joseph Biden, that victorious presidential candidate said on winning the election, America is back. Now that's the resistance narrative. Uh, the structural narrative uh, presents Trump as more of a symptom. Uh, and to that extent, those who have tried to craft a structural narrative of the last four years have worried for their part that we uh, might be overstating how close to the brink of fascism and tyranny America in fact is right now. Uh, and in fact, if we overstate it, we could lose the opportunity to pull it back uh, from getting closer. Sometimes the structural narrative, as I'm calling it, has focused on how Trump both epitomized, but also in a kind of paradoxical way, allowed for seeing some of the very long-term pathologies that led to his presidency. And here I'm referring not just to white supremacy, uh, which is at the focus in American politics, uh, like uh, really more than a century or at least 40 years, but also how undemocratic American democracy so-called always was and still is as a matter of its constitutional arrangements. And maybe most important for me personally, how mainstream policies of both political parties over the last few decades, policies in economics and policies in foreign policy helped lead to the disaffection of lots of people with uh, the, uh, their elite rulers and the attempt to eject them in favor of a charlatan uh, in 2016 as a, as kind of protest vote. So those are the two narratives. I'm glad to specify them further. It would be wrong uh, to say that you can't combine the two narratives. And actually, I think those um, uh, partisans of each of the two narratives have learned a lot from one another over 
the last four years because I think both sides have had part of the truth. I've learned a lot as a partisan of the structural narrative from some of the those telling the resistance story. I think the reverse is even more true that resistance narratives have become more structural over four years, have acknowledged how much needs to be fixed, how, how fanciful it is to think that just getting rid of Trump uh, would allow for a democratic safety. But the November election of, of 2020, just a few months ago, indicated that the resistance narrative didn't itself succeed in uniting a divided country. The sheer number, the greater number of those who supported Trump in 2020 suggested that calling for decency and a return to normalcy is not credible to enough Americans uh, to fix the situation. Only policy change can do that. Brian mentioned January 6th, a frightening event in 2021, just a couple of weeks ago. I won't get in right now, just lacking time to how to interpret that event relative to these two narratives. I'm glad to be pressed on that further. Instead, I wanna close by emphasizing that to the extent any part of what I'm calling the structural narrative is correct, the passing of Trump uh, tomorrow uh, finally won't mean that American democracy is safe, on the contrary. In fact, uh, what will matter most of all is how far the now governing Democrats, governing in both political branches, though not the judiciary, uh, can go to address root causes uh, of uh, recent political developments. The rhetoric, uh, uh, not so much of Joe Biden, but others suggest that Democrats know they have a tall order and uh, uh, really gargantuan task. But I'd say even the rhetoric suggests they accept this truth only to a limited extent. And I'm not sure uh, in politics, you know, to date that talk is a good guide to a uh, walk. So America's on the knife edge right now uh, and the four years to come and beyond are the decisive ones. I'll just add just for counterpoint that one of the reasons is that we can't be guided by ancient understandings of the promise and threat of democracy uh, in Plato and so many others. Remember that America, uh, ancient depictions assumed the impossibility of mass enlightenment and indeed uh, were skeptical of the ability of masses to engage in self-rule. But at least our beliefs in modern politics are different and presuppose that we can educate and empower ordinary people to escape the ancient syndrome of the devolution of uh, uh, democracy into tyranny. Well, that education and mass enlightenment is a long-term project, uh, but as I said, uh, uh, the next stage of it, uh, it in the medium term of the next four years uh, will prove utterly important, more important than what we've seen happen in the last four. Thank you very much. I'll turn now to Ben Chutman for the final presentation. Uh, thanks so much to everyone who's responsible for organizing this panel. It's, it's really a uh, privilege to be here. So in my remarks on the future of American democracy, I want to use the events of 6 January, 2021 to examine two things. First, I wanna discuss how there was not one, but two attempts at revolution on that day, one violent and the other legal. Second, I wanna talk about why I believe that that second type of rev revolution, legal revolution is a greater threat to the future of American democracy. For most of human history, revolutions happened through the use of force. Violence was something that was required in order to overthrow a government. However, in the early 20th century, revolutionaries discovered a new pathway for revolution. This new pathway was due to the nature of democracy itself. In a democracy, in principle, 
anyone has the right to run for public office to exclude a particular candidate because of their, their views from a democratic competition would be undemocratic. Enemies of democracy realized that they could run for and be elected to public office, just like any other candidate. If they could obtain high enough office, they could use the legal powers and procedures of that office in order to rewrite the existing constitutional order. In theory, they could transform the laws and institutions of a democratic state article by article and norm by norm into a totalitarian state. It was in this spirit that the Nazi Goebbels infamously remarked that the best joke of democracy was that it gives to its enemies the means to destroy itself. On 6 January, at the same time as Trump was encouraging his supporters to go down to the Capitol in order to quote, take back our country, Senators and representatives inside of the Capitol attempted to use legal procedures to accomplish the exact same goal. These congresspersons, including Senator Hawley, objected to the congressional certification of the electoral college votes of several states. By attempting to deny formal recognition to those votes, they hoped to overturn Biden's electoral victory, or at least to delay it. I don't wanna get into the details of the US electoral process. Suffice to say that congressional certification is widely recognized to be a formal ceremonial part of the U.S. electoral process. However, those senators and representatives recognize that this formality could be weaponized in order to overturn the process entirely. And they were trying to do just that right up until the moment that violent protesters burst into Congress. After order was restored, Senator Hawley resumed his objection to certification. In, in a moment of self-awareness, he argued that using violence to overturn an election is always unacceptable. But, he insisted, the use of legal means was something different. He argued that it was not only valid, it was vital to use legal means to halt the certification. Now, Hawley was not wrong to draw a distinction between the protesters' actions and his own. But the reason they are distinct is not what he thought it was. Their methods may have differed, but their goal was the same. Both aimed to overturn a valid democratic election. Despite their legality, those congresspersons actions were no less a revolutionary attempt. So from my perspective, 6 January, 2021 is a remarkable date in US history. Two distinct types of revolution were attempted at exactly the same time in the same place, one violent and one legal. Now, to call the abuse of illegal formality revolutionary may seem like an exaggeration. It isn't, and this takes me to my second point. Legal revolution is a greater threat to the future of American democracy. Successful revolutions of democracy increasingly come about through the abuse of legal formalities and procedures these days. I'll give you one recent successful example. In 2015, the Polish president, Duda, undermined the independence of both the judiciary and the rule of law more broadly by abusing a ceremony. He refused to swear into the constitutional court a set of judges who had been duly elected by the opposition. By not completing the ceremony, Duda could wait for a new parliament to nominate and elect a different set of judges, loyalist judges. He swore in that second set. And his actions brought Poland another step closer to autocracy by concentrating even more power into the president. Until then, swearing in judges had seemed like a mere formality. Yet it is ceremonies and other seemingly formal legal procedures that anti-Democrats weaponize today. And they do so in order to erode democratic institutions successfully. The successes of legal revolution make it a greater threat to democracy than violent revolution. Because violence is illegal, state authorities can respond to violent revolutionaries with the full force of the law. And violent revolution tends to unfold in days, in highly visible ways. Its illegality, its rapidity, and its visibility make it easy to identify when a line has been crossed, such as when a mob storms Congress. And we can see the response. U.S. authorities have already begun making arrests. 
Legal revolution, on the other hand, is more difficult to respond to. Those senators and representatives were authorized by democratic elections to use the legal powers of their office. Those legal powers include the right to object to the certification of states' electoral college votes. Their actions may have been morally abhorrent, but as long as they remain within the bounds of the law, it's not clear what recourse there is against such actions, if any. And because legal revolution proceeds in slow, barely visible steps, its subversive qualities can escape notice entirely. Senators Cruz and Hawley, for example, may have fewer friends in Congress, but they will finish their terms, and perhaps they'll even be reelected. Legal revolution amounts to a kind of constitutional death by a thousand pinpricks. Because its legality and its scale prevent a response, legal revolution is a greater threat to the future of American democracy. Um, I'm sorry to end on, on this particular note, but I'm pessimistic about the future. The two attempted revolutions of 6 January will cast a long shadow over American democracy. America will be more on guard against violent revolution, but as long as illiberal anti-democratic politicians continue to win elections and to hold public power, they will find ways to pursue their anti-democratic revolutionary goals using the legal powers of their public office. Thank you. Thanks very much to our three speakers for those very insightful and engaging comments. I wanna start out with a question that comes at things from a slightly different angle. So the three of you have mentioned institutional uh, uh, or institutional difficulties, policy difficulties, and difficulties surrounding constitutional conventions, which are sort of informal uh, norms of how government ought to proceed. But in the near future, uh, because all of those changes, of course, are going to be difficult and are related to one another in complex ways, I wondered about uh, free speech. So evidently, misinformation, lies, and conspiracy theories trumpeted on social media have played a key role in the current crisis. And yesterday, the Washington Post reported that Donald Trump's forced silence had led to a 73% decrease in election fraud claims on social media. While many countries limit hate speech and some like Singapore have checks on misinformation, the United States has remained unusually absolutist when it comes to free speech. Do the three of you think that the United States now needs to revisit this stance as an interim measure? Let's start maybe with uh, uh, Professor Moyne. I think it's a fantastic question and and you know one on which you know I, I'm ambivalent you know I I I was I have been worried because the uh, the you know justified censorship of Donald Trump has revealed just how much unfettered power private actors have uh, in our society. So you you could have as I do you know a skepticism of free speech absolutism and can you know consider the the routine banning of hate speech that you know the constitution and laws of many countries canada germany and so forth allow uh not just east asian uh, countries to be um totally defensible but still worry about in whom this power is vested um and uh the the the, the fall of trump i think um May, may prove to be superficial relative to the consolidation of private power over um, speech and you know even thought in in that's that's crystallized in our time. Professor Garston. Yeah, well, I too um, am very skeptical of the concentration of power that we see. Can you hear me? I'm very skeptical of the concentration of power that we see in these private firms. Um, and uh, in fact, I think there's likely to be a political backlash um, against it. And I notice that um, uh, in the days after January 6th, which Professor Shipman was talking about, um, one of the networks, uh, Fox News Network, for example, was able to focus almost entirely on the Twitter ban of Trump and the 
threat to conservatives rather than focusing on the dramatic events that had just occurred or the the impeachment which was occurring at the time. So I think um, there's likely to be significant political backlash um, to these actions. And, um, uh, and I think at the same time, the thoughtful regulation of new media um, is completely reasonable as a, a certain regulation of television and radio on the public airways um, took place. Uh, so I think those are problems to be solved. If, if I can just, just contribute a little bit um, to this question, Nomi, I think um, I, I agree with both uh, Professors Moyne and Professors Garston. Um, I think that uh, what, we're with, what we've witnessed in the United States really exposes a dilemma that digital technology poses to the ideals of liberalism in the sense that the ideal of free speech exists for liberals in order to promote the pursuit of truth, the pursuit of reason, the pursuit of best policies. But what's ended up happening is that these technology companies, uh, digital technology companies have been able to create an environment in which the opposite is happening, in which uh, free speech actually ends up promoting uh, untruth, or at least it can be. And to that end, I, I guess I agree with Professor, uh, Professor Garston that the the regulation of, of new media, the regulation of digital technology is, is vital uh, in order to promote the, the health and well-being of, of both liberalism and democracy, as, as well as the ideals that they seek to pursue. Nomi, we can't hear you. While we are waiting for Nomi to get her sound back, I'm going to ask the um, panelists uh, a couple of questions. Um, some of the uh, some of our audience uh, have asked a. Uh, uh, similar questions, um, partly for Sam, but also um, for everybody else. Um, going to this question about the narrative um, and um, what policies and changes do you think could be implemented in the next four years, um, you know, un under the Biden administration to begin to address the structural issues with U.S. democracy? Well, you know, if I if I knew th the answers with confidence, I you know, while I hope I would serve on this webinar, I you know would would have you know others beating a path to my door. But I I, I will say you know that beyond the the you know very clear need to to think creatively in relation to public and private authority, how to um, kind of create a a. a uh, the same space for American citizens, you know, to, to think about what's going on rather than kind of alternative realities is, is really important. But I, I would add that, you know, as I indicated, Donald Trump, um, you know, sensed some of the failings of uh, the elites of both parties, the party he conquered, and the, you know, party, the Democrats that uh, you know, he beat once and, you know, and, and, and then beat him once in the, the, and these failings were in the realm of economics and, and foreign policy. He, he complained that the American uh, middle class and, and maybe more broadly working class had been abandoned uh, to stagnation, which is true. You know, I think that, uh, you know, that uh, they, deserve some stagnation in light of uh, how, uh, how, how much equality economically on the world stage has been achieved in the last few decades. The trouble is that the rich have won along the way, and that's an affront to you know, the democratic idea, but also to a lot of people who voted for Trump. And then in foreign policy, Trump cr critiqued something Brian alluded to, America's endless war making, sometimes in the name of democracy, but usually postponing it. And so I think if the Democrats don't reset 
in these two areas, uh, they'll have, you know, um, just postponed uh, some of the, the protest and rage that led to Trump in the first place. So that's, that's where I'd like to see the Democrats move most credibly. Would any of the rest of you like to chime in there? Well, I'll just say a word, um, not about particular policies, but um, it will be very tempting for the Democrats just to focus on, um, on, on, on certain long held policy objectives that they now, because they control Congress and the presidency, finally have a chance of pushing through. And some of that is uh, makes sense, but there's another set of policies that have to do with the working of our democracy itself. Um, and now is also the moment to focus on those. And there, there's a real question about how to think about what needs to be done. On one account, I, I see emerging what I would like to call the new majoritarianism, which focuses mostly on um, the ways in which the American system uh, stands in the way of the emerging majority um, uh, uh, getting its, its will. Um, and there are clearly problems that need to be addressed um, there. But it's also true that majoritarianism can become tyrannical itself. And so figuring out how to balance uh, a more responsive um, system with uh, some, some sense of safety and integration for the people on the losing side, <laughs> the people who don't support the Democrats, and some recognition of, of, of the validity of some of their complaints that's, that's, a, that's a systemic challenge um, that involves real institutional thinking and not just thinking about immediate um, policy objectives. And I hope some of that happens in the next few years too. Okay, I, I wonder if we could turn um, uh, our speaker's attention to uh, uh, foreign policy. So we have a question from Nikita, uh, my former student. Hello, Nikita. Uh, Nikita is asking about the impact of current events on American soft power abroad. Maybe we'll start with Professor Shutman there. Um. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a fantastic question. Um, I think that the the events of, I mean, first of all, six January, as as well as more broadly, the the policies and acts of the Trump administration have really been detrimental to. Uh, at least some of the, the most important facets of, of U.S. soft power. Um, I think a lot of a lot of people around the world, uh, that is a lot of people within civil society, will will think twice about the values that the United States has long promoted. Um, they'll think twice about the values of free speech. They'll think twice about um, the values of popular sovereignty, of allowing the people to determine what policies they ought to be subjected to. Um, yeah, and of course it will also, um, it'll also give cover to governments that, um, let me say that one of the classic dilemmas of, of political theory or, or a classic supposed dilemma of political theory is the, uh, the opposition of security and freedom. And a lot of states, uh, well, democratic states obviously promise freedom and they attempt to promise uh, security as well. It's, it's not a true dilemma. You can have both, just like you can have little. But a lot of other states have promised security, particularly material security, in exchange for freedom. And I think a lot of states now will look at the, uh, the effects of the Trump presidency um, and draw the conclusion from it and push on their, their citizens uh, that it's impossible to have freedom at all let alone freedom and security. So I think a challenge for the Democrats and a challenge for the United States is really to figure out how to, how to uh, revitalize or rejuvenate the image of the United States in, in light of these events. Thanks very much. Uh, maybe in the interest of hitting as many of our audience's questions as possible, uh, we'll, we'll stick to one or two uh, replies to each one. So we have a question from uh, Jeanette Wong who's wondering about QAnon specifically. Uh, will QAnon uh, continue to play a key role in American politics uh, given uh, the, their recent disappointments? So uh, either Professor Garson or Professor Moyne, do you wanna start off there? Uh, 
Uh, you know, I'm not sure I have. I don't know. Um, and I, and I, um, I'm not sure anyone does. And I would class that under the problem that I tried to state is it's very difficult to tell how to think about what is going on online. It is tempting on the one hand to think that, um, you know, all sorts of things are said online and, um, and always were said uh, <laughs> uh, orally um, between people. And, and yet it wasn't in front of our eyes and, and, and those conversations didn't last in the way they do when they're written down online. Um, and, yet, and yet we've seen the explosion of the online um, chaos into, into the actual world um, recently. So, I mean, I don't have a prediction, but I think uh, as a general phenomenon, this question of um, how much of people's lives is, is, and how much of their emotional investment and how much of their partisan feelings um, is taking place in a virtual world and, and is content to stay in that world and how much will, will boil up into action in this world. I think we're just starting to figure out how to think about that. Really. Thank you. Uh, I think it might be worth noting that uh, um, there goes my daughter in the background. Um, I think it might be worth noting that that these these kinds of conspiracy theories have tended historically to have uh, quite a bit of staying power and to be able to adapt to disappointments along the way. Uh, so perhaps mm -hmm. Professor Moyne, as an historian, might might uh, have a parallel to draw. Um, if so, jump in, and otherwise we. We have uh, lots more questions. Well, I'll just you know comment for one second that you know a lot depends on whether you think changes in real conditions affect people's susceptibility uh, to kind of you know derangement, and which was totally you know available before the age of the internet dawned and affected a lot of people in the Cold War. And I just would add, I mean, notwithstanding the horrors of QAnon has been kind of equal opportunity in recent years with lots of conspiratorial thinking and paranoia on the left too. So I, I, I think we, we definitely need to think at, you know, at, in terms of governing the representational, but also if you accept the, the distinction at, at what we can do at the level of the real, if there is such a thing to change how, how, how divided America is. And, you know, maybe we can get into some of that with the questions about, you know, third parties and so forth. Thank you. Uh, Professor Schutman? Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Professor Lazar. Um, yeah, I think, you know, Q QAnon reflects one of the underlying, one of the underlying problems that gives rise to populist movements, which is that a lot of people believe that there is a cabal of corrupt elites that are that are working against them. And um, I think the, the, censor, the censorship that's happened through digital platforms and the, the, the supposedly false victory of the Democrats is going to reinforce a lot of the beliefs of this, this community of conspiracy theorists that there is a deep state comprised of elites who are actively working against the interests of the genuine American people. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, so Rachel Houseworth is asking where uh, the Republican Party might go from here. So uh, have, have recent events, uh, uh, I'm elaborating a little on her question here, but have recent events provided a sort of a, an out for those Republicans who want to separate themselves from Trump? Or will the fact that, uh, that uh, conditions that have led to the rise of Trump uh, probably remain uh, mean that Republicans will continue to have to appeal to that base. Any thoughts there? Um, do you want to start, Ben, since you're already on screen? Uh, sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, we can sort of see the future of the Republican Party already, just just in the way that they are reacting to the charge of impeachment. Um, looking at the House of Representatives, we can see that, uh, I believe it was 10, only 10 Republicans felt that Trump's incitement uh, of a mob, which which they witnessed with their own eyes, only ten Republicans in in the House of Representatives believed that that was an impeachable offense, and those who did vote against it, their political futures may be in jeopardy. 
So um, I, I think we can really see that the, the future of the Republican Party is to remain in the hands of, of Trump, or at least other figures within that broader Trumpian orbit. Maybe it's Senator Cruz, maybe it's Senator Hawley, whoever. Thank you. Any thoughts from the other two? Well, I, I would just point out that um, at this, uh, that's true in Congress at the moment. Um, at, in the US, we still do focus on presidential elections as kind of the regime and, and the Republicans have just lost. Uh, well, they've lost both Congress and the presidency and that tends to matter. Um, and I don't think we've seen actually the repercussions of that yet. It, it may take a while for that to shake out. So I think it's very up in the air what that party does. And um, even in the short term, you know, the, there's an obvious Machiavellian moment here for uh, Mitch McConnell and uh, uh, his sort of Republican to try to do damage to Trump. And, and frankly, there's also a reason for those who want to lead the populist wing of the party after Trump to kind of secretly um, allow that to happen, to hasten their own rise. So the politics both immediately and in the medium term, I think are, are pretty up in the air, um, but that party is clearly at a, 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 a potential, potentially a breaking point or at least a crossroads of some kind. Thanks very much. Uh, just, for, just for counterpoint, oh, sorry, I, go ahead. I, just for yeah. one small thing, which is that, you know, I, I, I am not as sure that um, it, it is as divided as, as my, my fellow panelists think, although I basically agree with them. Um, on January 6th, to me, you know, the, the far more important thing that happened at the Capitol was that Mitch McConnell and Mike Pence refused to go along with, the, with Donald Trump. Um, both before the riot and after. And someone like Josh Hawley, who I think has nowhere near the kind of, you know, in, kind of ineffable uh, charisma for the Trumpian base as, as, you know, Donald Trump himself has, has taken a pretty big hit, um, including kind of in, in Missouri, where I'm from, um, kind of uh, amongst Republicans. So, I, I don't know, I know, we've talked a lot about how their Trump, Trumpism remains alive and how there's gonna be a struggle to be the successor, but maybe it's premature based on what we've already seen to worry that that's, that's gonna be as scary as people say. Nomi, Nomi, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, so a question from uh, Zayden Tan, who asks uh, to hear your insights on the issue of elites and money and the role that they play uh, or have played in the attempted uh, coup. To provide some context, uh, the, the Guardian reported, quote, that siege was just one battle in a decades long assault on democracy funded by billionaire donors and corporate interests. What do you think, Zayden asks, are some viable solutions to these issues? Well, you know, I, I, I don't think we needed January 6th to reach the conclusion that the control of, 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 of money and politics is absolutely near the top of the list of necessary reforms to save American democracy. Anyone have anything to add? Perhaps um, how that could be accomplished? Well, I, I guess to be um, provocative or what do you say, Sam, to provide counterpoint, <laughs> the um, uh, it's striking how important money has become, especially with the weakening of the political parties. That is the opening uh, in the name of democracy of um, primaries in the presidential selection process has made um, money, uh, sort of floating money, <laughs> anyone's money, uh, much more powerful. Um, and an argument for strengthening parties would be not that they on their own eliminate money, but they somehow institutionalize and channel um, 
money or they could uh, if they were strengthened in the right way. So that's at least one thing that should be looked at, I think. And it's an example of why institutional reform has to have a slogan more complicated than um, democratize, democratize. Uh, because in some cases there are um, unintended consequences of reforms like the primary system, um, which were done in the name of more democracy. Okay, thank you. Um, so Marilyn Moger, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, is asking, how do we counteract the restrictions being placed constantly on voting in states? Maybe, uh, Professor Moyne, do you wanna start there? You know, I, I think that, you know, it's it's dawned on, on the Democrats long since that, um, the, the Republicans are a minority party um, and they, they're competitive with their recent policies mainly because of insufficient democratization. You know, so I agree totally with, with Brian uh, that we need to be on guard, but the question is from what baseline do we think about these questions? And uh, even before we get to the kind of um, voter exclusion through, you know, gerrymandering and 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 other mechanisms that have become the stock and trade of the Republican Party, we're we're dealing with constitutional arrangements that uh, that warp you know, American democracy. You know, if if it even deserves that name. So, you know, my sense is that. Um, the, the Democrats who have called for a, 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 a bout of lawmaking, so-called HR1 uh, type legislation that democratize the country and even uh, constitutional amendments to alter the significance of the electoral college, but mainly the Senate in, in the Republic is, you know, are, I, I'm, 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 I'm on the side of those who support such measures with all, you know, due caution. Professor Shutman, do you have any thoughts here? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I completely agree with uh, Professor, Professor Moyne's observation. The, the Republican party is, is definitely on track to becoming a minority party uh, and yet it's managed to hold on to power. I think uh, to answer the, the, the question that, that you originally posed, it seems to me we already have an example of how to counteract these restrictions, and it's it's the grassroots mobilization that Stacey Abrams exhibited in Georgia. I mean, of all the states that um, were projected to flip, I, I don't think Georgia was was toward the top of the list. Yet it was it was her, I think, a decade long or so worth of hard work that that's really produced this change and allowed. Um, allowed the majority to actually prevail within within that state. So Democrats, uh, that is the Democratic Party and other states will need to um, will need to learn from uh, from Stacey Abrams example and try and import it into their own states. Sorry, everyone, uh, just a second. A few minor technical difficulties here. Uh, okay, we have a question. Uh, I'm not sure who it's from. So is the US too focused on democratic process as an end in itself as opposed to achieving good governance? Is the US system capable of producing good governance? Uh, well, I, I think that's a serious question. Um, and as I, I said in my remarks, I, I think many people in light of the COVID response, maybe especially are asking th that question. Um, uh, you know, and time will tell on some of these issues, how, how good the governance can be. Um, but the, the, the first part of the question, are we too focused on democratic process? No, I don't think so. I think arguably we're not focused enough on it often. I, I think there's been, in fact, a move uh, over the past decades um, that puts policy uh, first and makes procedure always uh, its kind of um, 
um, junior partner. And the problem with that is that constitutionalism is essentially procedural. And that proceduralism can seem like nothing but an obstacle to putting good policy in place. Um, but once you go down that road, um, it's very hard to, to recover the culture of, of constitutionalism. Um, and you can't draw on it just when you want it. <laughs> um, so I think, I think actually uh, more attention to the questions of how we govern ourselves. And that means uh, it is democratic, but it means that we focus not just on participation, but on how we, we squeeze the best decisions out of ourselves possible. Under what conditions do we as citizens make the best decisions? That's what self-government requires thinking hard about. And that's what institutions and regulations and so on are meant to help us do. Put us, think of yourself as an individual. When you have important decisions to make, you sometimes think about what are the best conditions um, for you to make that decision? Should you take a long walk? Um, should you make the decision when you're on a sugar high? Um, it's no different in matters of governance. There's serious questions about the conditions under which we govern ourselves well. And, and that's the best way to think about what can otherwise seem dry procedural questions. I, I totally agree with Brian and would just add that, you know, the call for good governance is an alternative to democracy or, you know, of something of which we need more relative to democracy, you know, should, should be, you know, treated with some skepticism um, after recent years. Um, I mean, the, the allure of technocracy or, the, you know, the rule of experts goes back a long way in the history of political thought. Um, partly because there was such skepticism of democratic will formation and the possibility of mass enlightenment, but also because of a, a, a drastic overstatement of the capacities of experts themselves. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the key is to, you know, avoid inflating their role while making room for experts. I mean, as, as I've tried to argue, the rise of Trump is a response to the failure of self-appointed experts, um, not least in, in the foreign policy and economics uh, professions. And we need to contain the, the damage of their mistakes as much as to place power in their hands. And so that's a, an ongoing challenge is to make the proper role for experts and not allowing them to rule in our stead. Thanks, Professor Shutman. Do you have any thoughts here? Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with everything that uh, Professors Moyne and, and Garston have already said. I, I think one thing that might be worth adding in this context is that it's it's not that the United States government is not or does not have technocratic elements to it. To the contrary, there is a very large administrative apparatus that is uh, filled with experts and. Um, for, for better or for worse, it's it's due to the work of these these bureaucrats or these technocrats or whatever you want to call them, um, who have managed to uh, at least prevent some of the worst excesses of the uh, the Trump administration. Um, the ideal, of course, is always that a democratic government will maintain some sort of oversight over the technocracy, and I think I think this gets back to Professor Garson's and Professor Moyne's points, but it's not. We don't need to look at it as if it's an either or um, between good governance and democracy. Um, they can be mutually reinforcing and supportive of one another. Thanks very much. Um, we have a question, an interesting question. Uh, someone is asking, might there be a third party? Could it be that the Republican Party might, might split into two? And uh, I'll tack on to that question. What do you think the future of such a third party uh, could, could be? Is it sustainable to have three parties in the American system? So based on my you know, reading of, of the political science literature, but also recent American history, it strikes me as unlikely that a third party on either side of the spectrum can emerge. What I would do is um, alter the question to inquire about the prospects of what we call realignment, which is a reshuffling of the extant parties uh, so that they 
they reach out to, to different parts of the electorate currently divided uh, between the parties. And, and I would say, you know, that's my hope for American democracy, that we see some kind of realignment in the near term. Um, the trouble is that if you believe in such a thing that would um, put all the, the advocates of um, economic liberals, liberal, uh, economic liberalism or freedom and, you know, military overstretch in one party, you know, since they're, they're currently divided between the two parties and have ruled them in recent generations to allow for a new kind of middle and working class party. Um, it's not clear the Democrats are moving in, 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 in the proper direction. I mean, Joe Biden stands much more for a re re restoration of uh, the old partisan split. And, you know, there are noises coming out of the Republican Party, um, or at least its intellectuals, of its capacity to become a kind of middle or working class party. And I'm, I'm very um, upset that the Democrats aren't taking advantage of this historic opportunity to be the, the realignment party. And I hope that there's still a chance for it to become that in the years to come. If I could just add to that, you know, there's a question of, uh, there are, there's a cultural divide and there's, um, there are economic divides. And I think what Sam is suggesting is that on that sort of economic divide, it does seem, it's easy to envision that realignment. Um, but then there's a cultural politics, which is, remains very strong, and which in some ways the Republicans also seem poised, uh, if they can think clearly, to take advantage of. Um, and uh, so, it's, so it's not clear that the political leadership um, will follow the economics, or the, if you want to call it the class politics, um, uh, in the direction that Sam points. Although I do think that would be probably a healthy a healthy development um, and one that that is actually possible. So um, uh, we have some interesting questions about the relationship between policy failure and institutional failure. So these are two elements that have uh, been winding their way through through our discussions. And uh, Dylan Lee, I, if, I hope I've got uh, the right question asker, um, is wondering about the COVID, the failure of COVID policy, the COVID response in particular. Uh, so uh, uh, to, it seems to me this is a sort of a chicken and egg problem that the policy issues and the institutional issues kind of feed into each other. So I wondered if there were any thoughts uh, from the three of you about, uh, uh, about this. So what has to come first? Uh, changes to, uh, changes to, to institutional structures, structural changes, or uh, uh, changes with respect to, uh, for example, neoliberal policies or uh, uh, centralization of, of uh, 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 emergency management, for lack of a more subtle term. Actually, maybe does Professor Shutman want to start there? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really, in a certain sense, it's really an intractable, an intractable problem because if you try and address one, the other, the other facet of it will will undermine those attempts at solution. I mean, I feel like I, I feel like the, the the underlying problem is not. It's perhaps it's not actually the institutions or or the policies per se, but it's it, it, it's it's more of a cultural phenomena. And I think I think the problem that presents itself to at least to the Democratic Party right now is, is how can, there, there's a profoundly large amount of Americans, uh, let's say 74 million who, who have deep, deep grievances. And I think it's for a variety of different reasons. And the Democrats problem is going to be to figure out how to, how to reintegrate them into the American polity in, in order to make them feel as if all of the citizens of the country are working toward the same goal. Any other thoughts? All right, then we'll move to a question from uh, Steve Oliver, who asks, 
Insofar as the present attempt to impeach Trump for the events of January 6th fails in the Senate, what do you believe are the best alternative strategies to contain Trump or Trumpism in the coming years? Professor Garson, do you want to start there? Sure. Well, I would focus uh, less on Trump the individual. I, I don't know what his future will be. Um, and I'm not even sure that Trumpism, I'm still, I'm still hesitant to award him an ism. Um, but there are a set of, of, of let's call them populist um, complaints that have arisen. And some of them are, are completely divorced from reality, but others um, are legitimate. And uh, I think the best way to grapple with those is to, is to find the legitimate complaints there and, and offer um, solutions to them. So um, there's a big question in our society about work, about what has happened to work and how um, people who work uh, feel about themselves and their place in society and their conditions. Um, those, are, those are serious questions that have emerged from the globalization policies of the past uh, decades. And um, those are questions that just deserve to be answered um, and I'd say the same about some of the questions that have come up about immigration. Um, uh, th these are real questions and there should be policy debates on them. And that's actually, I think, the best way of, of, managing, of, of managing the challenge. I'll just add that um, the, you know, the, the strongest likelihood is that Donald Trump will get ensnared in uh, lots of litigation, including, you know, New York State uh, criminal indictments that you know will 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 make it impossible for him to run. But I would say that even if not, it's it's kind of a confession of weakness on the part of his enemies uh, that as if they 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 don't believe they can beat him as by offering an alternative and of of policy and vision to focus so singularly on the man and his demonic powers, which I think are actually pretty limited uh, as the last four years have shown. And so I, I just prefer, you know, though I understand the desire to condemn his vile acts of January 6th, that, that impeachment, you know, descend on the list of priorities right now. All right, we're gonna take one last uh, question. This question is from Robbie Short, and Robbie asks, what is the role of universities in preser preserving American democracy over the next few years? Uh, why don't we take each of you, and let's start with Professor Moyne because you're already on screen. Well, I'd just be brief. I, you know, I defend the noble task of universities to at least allow some of us to remain distant from the affairs of the day uh, and, to pursue, you know, disinterested and idiosyncratic scholarship, but it's also true that you know universities exist to familiarize students with the best of old and new thinking about you know ongoing quandaries, and that's our central mission. And I believe we're performing it well, and that um, you know there there's been a lot of overheated rhetoric about universities gone wrong but actually they're some of the best institutions uh in american life right now thanks very much uh professor garston yeah i, I mean i look i think they're crucial <laughs> i'm spending my my life at one and and was lucky enough to help found the one that's sponsoring this event um you know there are universities where we could talk about research there are also colleges that are devoted especially to um, not just educating individuals, but to showing that a certain kind of conversation is possible. Um, and there we can focus most on the quality of speech and a certain amount of freedom is necessary to have high quality speech. But um, I think that those kinds of conversations that can happen in college environments um, demonstrate the possibility of conversation in, in general. And so, that's another function I, I would point to. Thank you. And Professor Shutman, you get the last word. All right. 
Um, well, I, I agree with both um, professors uh, Garston and Moyne. I, I think I think the universities are, are are doing a good job. And with regard to some of the the other questions that have come up in this discussion, I think universities or better uh, American universities can be a way of of promoting American soft power in the sense of showing the value and the virtues of the ideals of liberal democracy. And we promote them by fostering those ideals within us, I mean, within, within these institutions, um, uh, by, by promoting both old and new texts and promoting uh, pluralistic, rational discourse among its participants. And yeah, I, I think that that's a really invaluable way of promoting a better future. So I'm, I'm a big believer in the value of, of uh, universities. Thanks very much. What a wonderful way to round out our conversation uh, this evening slash morning, depending where you are. Uh, so I'll just uh, turn uh, things back to, to Trisha to wrap up. Thank you so much. I think that was such a lovely way to end to talk about the possibility of, con of conversation um, as something so key to what colleges and universities do. And of course, that's what we try to do here and what we try to do with our colleagues across the, across the world at Yale. I wanna thank our panelists, our moderator, and all of you in the audience for incredible conversation, terrific questions um, that led to a wonderful discussion. I am especially grateful to our North American colleagues uh, who are willing to get up so early to be with us here in Asia. Um, I hope you will join us in the coming weeks for more of this kind of insightful, thought provoking and extremely timely programming. Um, I'll just give a little um, advertisement for what we have coming up next. On February 4th, we have Sten Vermund, the Dean of the Yale School of Public Health, Kyo Yekiang, the Dean of the Saswe Hawk School of Public Health, at NUS here in Singapore, and our own Jeanette Ikovich, our Dean of Faculty here at the college. They will be in another extremely timely conversation on reimagining public health, global leadership perspectives in a post COVID world. To be sure you don't miss anything, use the link that is uh, in the chat box um, and sign up for our mailing list. And we look forward to seeing many of you here again soon. Thank you so much for coming and good night.